Thanks for downloading the In Our Time podcast. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello. The Russian presidential elections take place at the end of the month and the acting president, Vladimir Putin, has promised that if he wins, he'll finally take the body of Lenin from Red Square and bury him. But whether the country will be able to escape the extraordinary influence of Lenin, his ideas and his machinery of oppression is another matter. Robert Service is the first biographer to have had access to the Lenin archives in Russia, and his book, Lenin, a biography, contains a lot of new and illuminating information. I'm also joined by Vitaly Vitaliev, former Soviet journalist of the year, who was brought up in a Russia where Lenin was the father of the nation. Robert Service, um, there's a great deal in your book that's new. What most uh, strikingly is... Uh, new to people who think they know a bit about Lenin? Well, I think that in years gone by it was possible to write political studies of the man um, in terms of what he was like as a party boss or as a world statesman or as a Russian revolutionary. What is now possible is to see where the man came from, what his family was like, what his cultural background was, what his philosophical assumptions were as they were laid down in his uh, early manhood, how he related to people as human beings, what sort of family he had, what sort of associates he had, and and, and what they did in order to enable him to become the great revolutionary that he was in 1917. Why was it so important to keep so much of this information under wraps? What, What sort of thing was kept under wraps? Oh, well, practically everything about the personal life that was thought to be uncongenial to the image of Lenin, the revolutionary saint. And since so much of Lenin wasn't very saintly, since he was a rather curmudgeonly type, since he was a very, very emotional man, since he wasn't a man who was calculating and hugely altruistic in most of his daily dealings, a lot of the personal Lenin was never allowed to come through the sieve. One embarrassment that the Soviet state had was the fact that Lenin wasn't wholly or possibly even at all a Russian. He uh, came from a mixed ethnic background of Jews, Swedes, Germans and possibly Kalmyks. And possibly there was a bit of Russian there as well. Over the years under Stalin, Lenin was manufactured into being a classic Russian revolutionary and the Stalinist state was a disguised form of Russian nationalist state to a large extent, so it would have been an embarrassment to have had a non-Russian to have founded that state. What else besides the that background? Some, anything about the way he behaved as a young man? that is new? Yes, I mean, Lenin was a, a, a rather strange little boy. Uh, as a baby, he was uh, literally a headbanger. Uh, his parents were very worried about him. They lived in a big wooden house and uh, he would periodically raise his head from the floor and bang it back down on the floor. And they were seriously worried that he, he, he was going to damage himself with this sort of behaviour. He was a, a really raucous little monster of a baby. And he was a rather selfish little boy thereafter. Uh, he didn't treat his sisters and brothers as well as they treated him. He was cheeky to his mother, especially after his uh, father died. He was an opinionated, self-centred little chappy, and the, and, the, and the brothers and sisters thought that and said that to him. His father was an upward demur by a middle-class man on the, uh, on the banks of the Volga, in, playing a small part in, one, in a Chekhov drama, really, wasn't he? <laughs> yes, you're right. They could have come out of a, a Chekhov play, the, the Ulyanov family, because Lenin wasn't his real name. And I think this is the key to a lot of what input we can now see uh, into the adult Lenin. Um, The fact that this was uh, a largely non-Russian family has an impact, not in terms of ethnicity, but in terms of marginality. The Ulyanovs were on the make. They were professional people. They were people who believed in education, in enlightenment, in achievement. They were people who thought then uh, not a lot about the old Russia. They thought about the new Russia, the new European Russia, the late 19th century Russia that was being built up at that period. And they were on the margins trying to get into the centre, but they wanted to be part of a centre that would be a different centre, a different Russian centre. And 
They suffered a series of terrible setbacks. The father dies when Lenin is in his teens, and then the older brother is hanged. I'll come back to that in a moment. Vitaly, Vitaly, can you tell us the Lenin you were required to revere when you were a boy? Well, uh, Who was Lenin to you when you were a school <laughs> Well, uh, until I certainly had an ability to think properly and on my own, which normally happens at the age of, you know, uh, different people at different times, but 15, 16, uh, certainly uh, I had uh, uh, well, a tremendous uh, respect, you know, for Lenin, who was literally uh, a godlike figure. Uh, little kids in the nursery uh, were often fed, you know, this myth about Lenin as a boy at the age of three, four, five, and it was not unusual uh, for them to profess love for Lenin first and love for their parents after that. Uh, all these nursery rhymes, I'm a little girl, I don't go to school yet, I've never met Lenin, but I love him very much, you know. We were all supposed to learn them by heart. Grandfather Lenin, he was everywhere, you know, his portraits were everywhere. Um, so when a child would go to school at the age of seven, normally it would happen, everyone was supposed to join the Oktyabriata, <clears throat> sort of like lower stage communist organization, which was compulsory, of course, uh, and carry a little pin of Jan Valodya Ulyanov, this uh, cherubic-looking little boy with curly hair and so on. And I still remember that for the loss of this pin, you know, I think some sort of a pretty severe punishment was involved. Whatever it was, I can't remember now, maybe being deprived of your uh, and what sort of what, whatever. What sort of things was, was Lenin glorified with being a miracle, a miraculous little boy? Of course, absolutely. Uh, there was a whole chunk of literature, uh, so, uh, the so-called Leniniana. Children's writers, you know, dozens of them, uh, produced uh, countless books uh, extolling the virtues of Jan Valodya, how honest he was that once, you know, I still can't, you can't forget this, this rubbish sometimes, you know, that he broke by mistake his mother's carafe, oh, yeah. uh, which his mother uh, loved it very much, and he was too frightened to confess in the beginning, but then he couldn't sleep all night. He was sort of tossing and turning in his bed, and then, uh, you know, he couldn't take it anymore, and he ran to his parents' bedroom and said, I'm so sorry, uh, mommy and daddy, but it was I who did it, you know. And they said, look how honest and how wonderful he was and how much he loved his sisters and brothers and so on and so forth. Uh, well, certainly, when you became older, uh, you uh, bound to start taking all this with a grain of salt because uh, that's what primitive propaganda always achieves. It achieves the completely opposite results from what it wants to achieve. And certainly there are lots of jokes, you know obviously, about this cult, you know, like, for example, uh, uh, there was a joke about uh, a triple marital bed as opposed to a double marital <laughs> bed, uh, which was called Lenin is always with us, because that was a popular slogan, which you could see everywhere, Lenin is always with us, Lenin is always alive, you see? So there was a very uh, strong religious context in all this, you know, Lenin is always alive, Levin, uh, Lenin never died, he is always with us, he sees everything, he knows everything, he guides us. And Extraordinary continuity of, uh, from Russian, Russian orthodoxy, isn't it? Extraordinary Absolutely. continuity Absolutely. from Russia. Absolutely, yes, exactly. That's why Lenin hated uh, religion and priests so much. So what you're saying is by the time you start to think for yourself, there's already among intellectuals a certain degree of, uh, or developed degree, perhaps, of scepticism about Lenin. But nevertheless, what do you find new and revealing in uh, Robert Service's new, new biography? Quite a lot. Uh, you see, uh, no matter what uh, the downside of primitive propaganda is, I just mentioned it, it still does its job. And certainly, uh, the dominating view among the intellectuals, so-called intellectuals, you know, in the Soviet Union was that uh, basically Lenin was not so bad, and maybe it was Stalin who was really a monster, you know, and an evil man, but Lenin was more or less okay, and he was modest, and he was honest, and so on. And certainly this book uh, uh, basically proves that uh, uh, it was not true at all. Uh, I've read many uh, biographies of Lenin published in the West, and I think basically this is the first, uh, to my mind, attempt to portray Lenin uh, basically as a human being, as a dysfunctional person, as a political uh, adventurist, uh, as opposed to most of other biographies who mostly look basically at Lenin as politician. And there are lots of rumors, you know, around this name, of course. And I think uh, Robert Service has managed uh, to write a book uh, that uh, gives a fairly objective portrait of Lenin. One of the striking things about Lenin's childhood was that his older brother, Alexander, 
was executed for attempted regicide in 1887. He took the whole burden of the student plot on himself and, according to your book, uh, mm. used the court to uh, proclaim his beliefs and partly because of that was one of the four who were hanged for this. Now, this had a tremendous effect on the family. They were socially ostracised. What effect do you think that had directly on Lenin's uh, uh, emotional intellectual development? Oh, I think he uh, was awfully traumatised by this, as anybody would have been, but he revealed very quickly this side to himself of being able to keep it all from himself and from everybody else and putting a lid on things. So he internalised a lot of uh, his pain. He internalised a lot of his hatred, not just for the Romanov imperial family, but for all of those upper and, social, uh, and middle classes in Simbirsk, this Volga city where he lived, who ostracised the family, who wouldn't have anything to do with them, wouldn't speak to them in the street, despite the fact that none of them were guilty of any crime whatsoever. They just happened to be related to the brother who was hanged. And I think that, that this cold, calculating hating side of Lenin was consolidated uh, uh, at the point when the brother is hanged. And, and Tony, why do you think the uh, archives of Lenin have been unsealed now in the last few years? Um, this is a huge decision, and why was it taken? Because they must have known, well, they, must have, they must have known, that they didn't know that bad stuff was going to come out. Well, You're I've been in that archive, head. and a lot of, uh, two or three lady archivists know mm. what is in this material, but People suspected, but very few people... If you were an archivist in the Soviet Union before 1991, you had to swear an oath not to reveal anything in print or uh, orally as to what you knew from those archives. So, so, so there were always grounds for suspicion, even but not so, for knowledge. Even so, it's a bit of a gamble to put yeah, it Yeah, even in. newspapers more than 20 years old were actually confidential. So, so why do you think they did it Yeah, now? I think one of the reasons is uh, that uh, the cult of Lenin is no longer official. It stopped being official. It stopped being uh, sort of an officially guarded secret, which does not mean that the cult of Lenin, you know, a sort of a popular cult of Lenin, is over. It's not over yet. He still has plenty mm. of followers, mm. you know, people mm -hmm. who still believe that he was, you know, right for Russia. And he's still looking over Russia. He's still uh, there. In many ways, still in the bed. Sometimes this, uh, this unseen <laughs> presence, yes. He's, but he, he's still in, in many Russian beds, yes. Did reading Robert Service's book give you a different perspective on your own country's history? Well, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't say that. Uh, I'm a defector myself, so I, I never had sort of, uh, <laughs> especially in the last year, in my last years in the Soviet Union, many illusions about about that country, that society, and that system. But certainly, uh, lots of insights on Lenin himself and uh, these little details. Uh, like, for example, I never knew that one of his sort of biggest literary influences in childhood was uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Having this uh, book as, as his literary icon strikes me as very, uh, uh, as quite immature. I mean, we all loved this book in our childhood and so on, uh, but I think it was a blow, uh, well, to this view that subconsciously one still has that Lenin was a genius of a sort, you know, that he was sort of unusual from childhood. I think basically the biggest revelation about Lenin uh, especially uh, well, about his youngest, was how ordinary a person he was in many ways, apart from being, uh, well, as I said, psychologically unstable, you know. But he was, he was an ordinary man, and I remember, I'll never forget when I first saw him in, in the mausoleum, you know, when I went to the age of nine with my grand, I couldn't believe how ordinary this uh, great man looked, you know. We b believed that he was a great man. Uh, so that was one thing, uh, well, and uh, certainly I knew... Uh, uh, f from other reading and my own research that Lenin was always a control freak, you know, that he was the father of state terrorism. But uh, reading about his journey back to Russia on a German train, you know, this famous journey, and how he was rationing toilet paper, you know, <laughs> yes. that was unbelievable. And that actually tells you much more about Lenin mm. than uh, many academic mm. political biographies. Mm. Seems uh, to work, though. I mean, cutting down the queues to the news <laughs> on the trains by issuing big pieces of paper for the real visit and small pieces of paper for the quick smoke. Yeah, you can argue. We, we were told this cleared the queues now. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was very petty, you know, in many things, so curmudgeonly. Robert Service, Thomas Carlyle famously said that history is the biography of great men. And uh, he famously, Tolstoy violently disagreed. And the forces have been with Tolstoy for the last century, that history moves forward uh, through a mass of people's involvement, and this isn't only Marxist view, it's accepted. Um, do you think that the, the life of Lenin and his individuality was key 
to the way that the Soviet Union developed, and that actually this business of, oh, somebody else would have done it if he hadn't, is, is, is sort of nonsensical. I, I'm not a Carlylean, but I do think that Carlyle had a point that great men, for good or evil, can change the course of history. I think that had it not been for the Great War, the First World War, and the consequent military defeat of Russia, its economic collapse, its administrative disintegration, and also the fact that no great power could intervene in Russian affairs substantially. We would be reading about Lenin in, in the footnotes of scholarly articles. He was enabled to become a great man and to use all the talents that he had, and he was a phenomenally talented person intellectually and practically. He was very charismatic as well in, in, in the circles of the party. But that would have not been anything at all but a footnote to a scholarly article had it not been for the Great War. The Great War smashed Russia, smashed old Russia, and Lenin came back to a country in chaos. And in such circumstances, a party that decisively puts itself forward as an alternative government of reform and of order stands a much better chance that it, than it would do in stable circumstances. And a leader of such a party who confirms the line of the party in the direction of taking power has an exceptional opportunity that, 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 that is not likely to occur in any other circumstances. To that extent, his career is an example of how great men become great men in history. Do you agree with that, Vitaly Vitaly? Do you think that Lenin's character became the character of the Russian state? Uh, yes, in many ways I do agree with that. I also think that Lenin was extremely lucky as a politician. Mm. It was a combination of all these factors mm. that Robert mm. has just mentioned. Plus, luck, it, luck plays a huge role in politics. And uh, I actually i am very pleased with the, with the conclusion that Robert makes that Lenin was unexpected. Indeed, you know, it's history. If you look back, I think it was Nietzsche who said that history is... Uh, just uh, a, ch a chain of absurdity and incident, and this is a very good proof of that. Had it not been for his sort of, uh, in many ways, repressed childhood and for his childhood traumas, for the Great War, for the fact that Russia actually uh, was very much a totalitarian state even before the 1917 revolution. Russian people used to be serfs, slaves, you know, Russian peasants until 1861. Lenin was born only nine years later. Uh, and, uh, well, if you read some uh, impartial descriptions of uh, uh, the pre-First World War Russia, you know, uh, it is just amazing. Like, for example, Bedeker's Russia 1914, uh, he gives advice to travelers uh, to try not to take photos at railway stations because mm -hmm. the police doesn't like it, mm -hmm. not to bring any foreign newspapers because mm -hmm. they're likely to be confiscated. So it was very much a totalitarian society already, plus certainly the war. And Lenin was always of the opinion uh, that a revolution needs a war that wars help revolution, mm -hmm. you know, that one can actually ride on top of uh, uh, any major conflict uh, to establish his own order of things. But I'd like to get back to this point. I'll ask Robert Service about it now. I'd just like to get part of it. Can you characterize some of the uh, things that happened under Lenin and flowed from Lenin? Can you say these happened because of Lenin? These things, uh, for example, the one-party mm. state in the way it was formed, which became such a successful export mm. from Russia, this mm. happened because of Lenin, his personality, his, uh, his ideas, uh, and it would not have happened if it had been somebody else. I would say that. I think that the one-party, one-ideology state, the state of legal nihilism, the, the state of mass collectivist mobilization was largely a product of the doctrines of Lenin. The reason why these doctrines became consolidated into a, a whole-scale ideology have to do with the way that the October Revolution took place in 1917, and that was largely the work of Lenin. There would have been a revolution in any case in late 1917, but Lenin had a decisive impact on the kind of revolution that took place and the way that that revolution went turning itself into a one-party dictatorship. To that extent, then, he, he moulded the one-party, one-ideology state, and since that was then exported to nearly half of the world's uh, states by, by the 1960s, he had an enormous personal impact. What I would say, however, is that he didn't have a master plan 
just as capitalism was developed rather casually and um, rather on an improvised basis, uh, so was communism. What I try to show in the book, though, is that although he didn't have a sort of master plan, he had a set of basic understandings about history and about politics, about dictatorship, about terror, about class struggle, about hierarchy, about discipline, and above all, about leadership, correct leadership. And when he met with difficulties after the October 1917 revolution, he always returned to those assumptions. And out of this came the communist one-party, one-ideology state. He didn't know he was going to do it before he did it. But it was largely, I would say this actually, it was largely the work of a single mind leading an, an extraordinary party of people whose minds were already turning it vaguely in that direction. But he gave it the, the sort of cutting edge that it would otherwise have lacked. And yes, I would say that this extraordinary 20th century invention, the one party, one ideology state, wouldn't have been invented without Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. Why do you think it... Uh Vitaly, why do you think it worked for so long in Russia, this, uh, this idea which, since it's departed, or I hope it's departed, yes. has been proved to be rotten to the core? I think I can answer in one word, you know, and this word is terror. Uh, Lenin uh, very quickly realized that a, a system like that could only work, you know, on terror. Fear is a very, very powerful thing. My grandparents were still remembered Stalinist times, for example, and the Stalin inherited Lenin's doctrine, basically. They were saying about this animal fear that paralyzed people, literally, when people were fainting from a knock at the door uh, after dark because they all thought, you know, they, they were going to be arrested, you know, and, and executed. And this was just taking, you know, this Lenin theory uh, of terror one step forward because if you read all these declassified letters of Lenin now, he was very much a proponent mm. of mm. the Bolshevik terror. Mm. You know, thank God you don't know, you know, what state terror can do, you know, in several generations. It almost kills essential human genes as those of, uh, you know, honesty, impartiality, principles. Nothing like that existed. And Lenin was the father of it all. Complete amorality, you know, of politics, you know. He was the one who started it. And yet, as you said earlier in this discussion, uh, you had the notion and post uh, and commentators said, well, on the whole we can put up with Lenin because he was a pure intellectual. It was brutalized by Stalin, but we discover uh, that Lenin was capable of, in fact, executed, and I can use that uh, accurately, mm. um, brutality on a considerable scale as well. Yes, and was quite casual, almost in his delight, at applying terror. I mean, there's that terrible letter he wrote in 1918 to the Penza communists saying, catch a hundred kulaks, mm. rich peasants and, mm. and priests, mm. and hang them, and hang them so that the people will see, the people will tremble. So he, he wanted not just to traumatize the, the middle and upper classes, as and we tell you, saying, it, and take hostages. Take hostages, yeah. 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 So yeah. this is state terrorism, you know, par excellence. But he wanted the effect to be understood by the very people in whose name he'd made the revolution, the peasants uh, and the workers. There was, the, the, there was a, a big aspect of Lenin then that was connected up with, with, yeah, with terror. But also, though, he, he was a man who had a vision of a long-term future in which there would be no oppression, no exploitation, no national discrimination of any kind. He was also an idealist, and we miss something if we think of him as not being motivated by more generous ideas of human organization. And that's the Lenin who is often picked up by reform communists in the 1980s in the Soviet Union and communist intellectuals and sympathizers in the West. I've always thought that this was um, a rather light-headed approach to Lenin, um, usually an approach to Lenin as he lay dying when he fell out with Stalin. And because he fell out with Stalin, it's always been assumed that he wouldn't have had the same kind of terror state um, that, that arose in the 1930s. But the antidote to that is to look what he was writing before the revolution, especially his political masterpiece, The State and Revolution, which is so often interpreted as if it's a libertarian tract. In fact, it's a tract in favor of dictatorship and against democracy.
So you've arrived at the two Lenins towards the end of this program, Italia. We have Lenin, who's one party state. You can see why that traveled with people, putting it terribly crudely, wanting to centralize and grab power, saw this as a brilliantly successful model. And if it had worked in such a big place as Russia, it could even work in an even bigger place as China. It could work in a smaller place like Cuba. It could mm -hmm. work, and it did. Mm -hmm. So that's one. The other side of Lenin, which I'm glad Robert Service brought up, is a Lenin who, in over the last half century in the West, Western Europe and in parts of America was, uh, if not idealized, uh, he wasn't demonized at all. That part of him seemed to sort of fall off as, uh, as the aeroplane went over the Urals. And, and uh, we had Lenin, the intellectual, the thinker, the man who was part of progressivism. Does that surprise you? No, it doesn't surprise me. I, see, <clears throat> I think partly it is the result of uh, that very Soviet propaganda, you know, that I uh, mentioned in the beginning. Uh, and the lead of terror that surrounded that society. It was very hard even for Western biographers to get objective information. I think if we knew more of the facts, you know, like uh, we know now, probably there wouldn't have been such a cult of Lenin uh, in the West. On the other hand, it, it is uh, certainly idealism, you know, on, um, of the certain part of Western intellectuals, of the people who actually never knew and never wanted to know what it felt like living in a totalitarian state, but they were quite happy to advocate it here from, you know, their nice houses and flats in good areas of London and other places, you know, just saying, you know, how great it is, you know. But uh, normally, you know, in the Soviet times, I remember, a 10-day-long trip to Moscow would cure many of them. You know, they would come back and say, we are going to Tory now. Uh, <laughs> there's a, one of the images after 1989 in Eastern Europe and in Soviet Union is of statues of Lenin being pulled down. Do you think that the Lenin being pulled down has left a dangerous vacuum or a, uh, possibly, a, if can there be a positive vacuum anyway? What influence, what impact do you think that has had? Well, I, I think it's easy to pull down a statue, you know, which it's much harder to change the mentality, mold it, you know, in several, in three, almost four generations of people. And, and that's what the main monument to Lenin still is, you know. So uh, in, in many uh, parts of the former Soviet Union, you know, the ones that I visited, where monuments to Lenin used to stand, he's still conspicuous by his absence. You can almost see the ghost of this monument there. And if you look at what's happening, uh, well, even in Moscow these days, well, you can conclude that uh, Lenin is still very much alive and kicking. The KGB, which was uh, in many ways Lenin's creation, yes, and it's the worst terrorist organizations in the history of humankind, just in terms of how many millions of people it killed, which has not been reformed at all. You know, it's still there. Uh, and the man who was nurtured, you know, by this organization is now about to take supreme power in Russia, supreme control in Russia. Uh, so, yes, I do see uh, uh, in, in, in this very sad fact uh, uh, Lenin a bit on. of Lenin's legacy. And Lenin is still in bed with the Russians. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. I've been talking to uh, Robert Service and Vitaly Vitaliev about uh, Robert Service's book, Lenin, A Biography. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this Radio 4 podcast. You can find hundreds of other programmes about history, science and philosophy at bbc.co.uk forward slash Radio 4.